Chang'an, China, 649 CE. Once, Lady Wu lived in the palace. Once, she attended the emperor and flirted with the prince regent. Once, she was known as the Fair Flatterer, a nickname comparing her to a popular ballad. But now she sits in the Buddhist convent, her emperor dead, her hair shorn, and her life over. Her lover, the new emperor, had promised to send for her, but as she watches the leaves outside begin to curl and fall, she worries that she too will dry up and die here. She writes him a poem. Watching red turn to green, my thoughts entangled and scattered, I am disheveled and torn from my longing for you, my lord. She dispatches it to the palace, and soon after, the emperor Gaozong arrives to offer incense to the Buddha. But upon seeing each other, the two burst into tears, and the court begins to whisper. Within a year, fair flatterer Wu will be back at court, and the harem will descend into war. Thanks so much to Trade Coffee for keeping us history-loving beans very well caffeinated. This meeting of Wu and Emperor Gaozong is the traditional story of how the two came back together, but there are reasons to doubt it. It's been pointed out, for example, that Buddhist nuns must shave their hair. Yet the record states that within a year of returning, Wu's hair had reached seven feet long, suggesting she never cut it at all. Likewise, Buddhism was not yet a favored religion in the Confucian court, making Wu's exile there a strange aberration. Due to these inconsistencies, it's been suggested that the convent was actually a cover, a way to keep Wu close enough to the palace to visit, but also out of sight so Gaozong could carry on their affair in secret. Either way, someone else appeared to notice that the two were still attached. Gaozong's chief wife, Empress Wang. And in Wu, the Empress thought she found the perfect solution for a problem she was having. See, Empress Wang was a high-born, smart, and refined lady. A good wife for Gaozong. But she wasn't really a good match for him personally, and she didn't seem to be able to have children. This made her position incredibly precarious. Her main job was to provide an heir, after all, and that wasn't happening. In fact, she was so worried about being demoted that she took the drastic step of adopting the children of lesser concubines to give herself legitimate heirs. But the biggest threat to Wang was from Gaozong's favorite concubine, pure consort Xiao. Not only was Xiao more beautiful and amenable than Wang, but she'd given the emperor one son and two daughters. Worse still, that son was a straight-up child prodigy, real crown prince material, and Xiao had riled up a court faction that was pressuring Gaozong to name her son his new heir. So in Wu, Empress Wang saw a weapon to break up this love triangle, move Wu back to the palace, and Gaozong would spend all of his attention on her and forget about Xiao. And since Wu had been Gaozong's father's concubine, and any union between them would be legally incestuous, Wu could never be promoted to replace Wang. Huh? Now, if you were sitting at home thinking this sounds like a horrible plan, well, that's because it was. But let's keep a few things in mind here. Firstly, these three, Gaozong, Empress Wang, and Xiao, were all in their early 20s. So, like, basically, imagine them as a bunch of college juniors, and this plan's logic kind of makes a little more sense, right? Second, they weren't used to palace intrigue. I mean, Gaozong was never even supposed to become emperor. He was the third soft son of Taizong, whose two older brothers were jockeying for the title of heir. But their rivalry became so intense that they'd both independently hatched plots to depose their father and gotten banished to remote border postings. And look, I know you'd like to hear about that as well, and honestly, you kind of should, because oh boy, that story is just full of the juiciest juicy juice, like their secret gay lovers, murder plots, and people dressing up as Turkic nomads. But if we stop this series and detail every subplot of palace intrigue, this series would last a lifetime, aka too much tea to spill. This is Imperial China after all, they have a lot of tea, heck, they invented it. Getting back to the point though, both Wang and Xiao had joined Gaozong's harem when he was the third son. And now this high-pressure environment of plots and intrigue surrounding an emperor was very new to them. So Wu returned to the imperial harem as a handmaiden to Empress Wang, where the empress could keep tabs on her and get face time with the emperor when he saw his old favorite. And at first, it worked. Xiao's hold on Gaozong lessened as he became reinfatuated with Wu, showering her with gifts. But what Wang didn't realize was that Wu had already spent 11 years in the Imperial Harem, and in that time had learned to be quite the canny operator. For instance, instead of eating the sweets that Gaozong brought her, Wu shared them with the servants of the Harem. 
Rather than wear the fine jewelry he lowered around her neck, she used it to win the loyalty of other concubines or by influence among court factions. See, in their rivalry, both Wang and Xiao's popularity had dwindled in the harem. They'd become haughty and arrogant, treading rough on those beneath them. Wu, by contrast, used the Emperor's gifts as a war chest to win allies and set up an intelligence network. Within a year, Wu had spies in every part of the harem and friends at court. After all, many of those high officials had sisters, nieces, and daughters who were also imperial concubines. Many were also from noble families connected to the two previous dynasties, who were currently on the outs now that the upper realms of the court were stacked by men who'd fought in the rebellion to establish the Tang. She targeted younger people, particularly those who had been dishonored, had something to prove, or that had a flaw that held them back. And gradually, she poisoned court opinion of both Wang and Xiao. Side note, she was almost continuously pregnant for those three years, having two sons, yet another disaster for Empress Wang, and a daughter. A daughter Gao Zong was so excited to see, mind you, that upon her birth, Wu came to get him and they went to meet the baby arm in arm. But as they approached the crib, they quickly realized something was wrong. The infant was too still to be sleeping. It was dead. Howling in agony, the bereaved parents asked a maid what had happened, to which she could only answer that the Empress had come for her formal visit to the child and, finding Wu absent, had played with the girl before leaving. Wu immediately accused Wang of poisoning the baby out of jealousy. Now, later tales speculated that Wu killed the child herself in order to frame Wang for its murder, but a far more likely explanation is that it simply was a tragic but not uncommon case of crib death that then Wu turned to her political advantage. Either way, the slander worked. Wang lost favor and was tainted by the scandal, while Gao Zong began to talk openly about demoting Wang. At first, he discussed simply promoting Wu to a new rank of chief consort, which would sit between full empress and second rank concubines, but soon he was discussing replacing the empress herself. But to do that, they would need the assent of the ministers, the old guard, Taizong's companions from the war, who still ran things. And man oh man did those guys distrust Wu, and quite frankly were disgusted with her background. So Wu turned up the heat having the emperor host lavish dinners for them, where he plied them with gifts, and she activated her agents at court to bring more pressure. The break came when she enlisted an aristocrat known for being, to put it in mild terms, a, uh, oh, here it is, a sneaky little snaky snake. Cat Lee, he was called, the sword in the smile, both nicknames coming from his duplicitous nature. He was the one who openly proposed the change, but the ministers resisted until Wu delivered the coup de grace on both of her rivals. An agent told her that the Empress and Consort Xiao, joining forces against a common threat, had been practicing witchcraft against her, sticking needles and dolls to try to kill her with Taoist spells. The use of such magic in the palace was a capital crime, considered as serious as trying to stick the Emperor and his chosen consort with real-life blades. And that was that. Empress Wang and Consort Xiao were stripped of their ranks and exiled deep into the palace. And five years after returning to court, Wu took the position as Empress at Gaozong's side. And her rivals? Well, traditional accounts have it that Wu ordered their hands and feet chopped off and that they be thrown into a vat of wine. And supposedly as they drowned, she said something to the effect of, Now those witches can get drunk to their bones. Of course, that's almost certainly a fabrication. The truth being not quite as fancy. Wu simply had them assassinated. Whether by poison, blade, or a forced suicide, she had done what Empress Wang had wished, broken a love triangle once and for all. But they would not be the last rivals she had killed, because she had an empire to run. And as we're gonna find out next week, empires are lubricated with blood. Unless, of course, you're talking about the extra history empire, that is, which I can tell you from first-hand experience is entirely lubricated with delicious coffee from trade. One of my New Year's resolutions, other than, you know, romancing every Baldur's Gate 3 NPC, is to never run out of coffee again, because I gotta tell ya, if that happens, things get pretty dark. Luckily, I got Trade Coffee, who deliver me fresh curated coffee roasted to order from my local roaster right to my door whenever I need it. For me, that would be weekly. And the really cool thing is that they use their expertise to map your specific tastes against their hundreds of different coffee flavor profiles, meaning they can help find the perfect roast and grind specifically for you every single time. 
For instance, Trade has matched me with a bunch of great blends from local NYC roasters, and they're all in my rotation now. Not only do they grind it perfectly for my French press, but it also means I never have to make a bleary-eyed morning trek to the grocery store ever again. And of course, I know Jeff is still on his quest to try every dark espresso bean in Trade's roster, which might end up taking him a while. So if you would like to join us in upgrading your morning routine with way better beans, right this very moment, Trade is offering a free bag of coffee with every subscription when you use our link, drinktrade.com slash extra credits. You can sign up for Trade right here and get free coffee. And then once you're fully caffeinated, check out another one of our videos here. The biggest bean thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koy, and Michael Hoggett for being our legendary patrons.